uh, India's Maritime History, uh, which was an, a very enjoyable book. Uh, Mr. Sanyal is currently the uh, principal economic advisor to the government of India and also serves as the co-chair of the G20 Framework uh, Working Group. Uh, before joining the government, uh, he was in the financial sector for two years and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank, uh, named a young global uh, leader by the WEF or World Economic Forum in 2010. He's also a well-known environmentalist, environmentalist and urban theorist. Uh, Sanjeev attended Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi, and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. His best-selling books include The Land of the Seven Rivers, The Indian Renaissance, and the book that I mentioned, The Ocean of Churn, uh, all published by Penguin. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, All India Management Association, as you know, is the national apex body for management profession in India. Uh, over the last five decades, we've con contributed immensely to the enhancement of management capability in the country. We have over 65 local management associations, and our membership is over 35,000 individual members in number. So you will be speaking uh, about uh, Atmanirban Bharat, uh, self-reliance as a growth strategy. In this uh, era of the coronavirus, and all of us who are slowly but surely uh, recovering. And as things start opening up, I guess uh, everything is going to change and hopefully for the better. So we'd like to hear more about uh, self-reliance as a growth strategy, uh, so well articulated by our Prime Minister a few weeks ago. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much uh, and a good afternoon to everybody. I have had the uh, privilege of speaking at various IMA uh, events over the years. Um, so, uh, good to be back uh, to speak to all of you again. Now, uh, the one thing I'm not going to do is to repeat a long series of measures that have been announced over the last month or so, particularly by the finance minister. Uh, you've all read that in the newspaper. I'm sure you all have strong opinions one way or the other on them. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is maybe do something, step, uh, a few, take a few steps backwards and take you through the thinking process, really about many of the things we are doing. And then you will get a sense of many of the things we may do, both on the demand side and on the supply side. And hopefully convince you guys that maybe we are not as crazy as you think we are. Um, so the question here is, <clears throat> um, how do we uh, respond to the current situation? And you will see that the way we have responded to it uh, is a lot to do with, and since this is, a, as I said, a management uh, grouping, and so many of you have to do this yourselves, is how do you make decisions in an environment of radical uncertainty? That is really about what, what explains our thinking. Very uh, early on, remember when the lockdown was done, and so I'm, what I'm gonna do, by the way, is show you that there is absolute consistency in our, uh, in our approach to dealing with the health crisis and the economic crisis. It's the same thinking process and you'll see why. So let us go and look at how the health crisis was, has so far been dealt with. You see, if, if you went back to mid-March, <clears throat> what is the information we had? We had an information that some, something very nasty had happened in China, although we weren't very clear or confident of what had happened. Uh, the WHO was being all very mealy-mouthed about what was going on. But we also knew that something had happened in Italy and it had killed a lot of people and was killing a lot of people. And it appeared to be spreading to other countries, particularly in Europe. That is essentially the information we all had, not just us in the government, but you as well. Now this, given that this was the information, we obviously called in all the experts and the experts gave us a very wide range of things that could happen <clears throat> from herd uh, immunity to, um, um, you know, projections where uh, literally millions of people would die in India. Uh, again, you will remember this from uh, that, uh, the, the newspaper reports of that time. So the one thing that we understood out of all of this is that essentially nobody had a clue. So rather than decide on which of these models was going to be uh, the best model and opt for one of them. Now, some countries did that, uh, you know, the UK opted for a certain thing uh, on herd immunity and changed. Um, Sweden went for a Swedish model and stuck with it and, you know, whether it's good or bad, I'll let you judge. 
um, Singapore took a certain tack and then changed it and so on and so forth. Other countries did similar things. Some succeeded, some failed. I'm not here to judge that. But the main point we are making to you is that we had a problem that with 1.3 billion people, we had to have a strategy that we didn't have to, we wouldn't be able to change it. And once we took that, we couldn't do Singapore and change it halfway through. So we had to take a strategy and we had to stick with it. So what do we do under those circumstances? So we opted for what is known as a barbell strategy. Now, those of you from finance will know what a barbell strategy is. But those who are not, let me explain. Barbell strategy is the following strategy where you essentially hedge for the very worst outcome on one side. And for the rest, you opt with a feedback loop step-by-step -step approach. So this is basically what we did. In a situation of radical uncertainty, you, we basically did a full lockdown starting uh, with, the, I think, the 22nd or whatever in March. And then we did a full lockdown. Now, this is not because we were 100% sure that that was the, the only response possible, because we basically were hedging out the worst outcome. That bought us time then to begin to doing other things, which is put together testing, put together some quarantining facilities, gather information from other countries and our own thing about what the nature of this beast was, and so on and so forth. So that is, so basically that, once we had hedged out the worst, we began to do the feedback loop. And that is how we have continued to do throughout. The underlying understanding of this is that this is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And therefore this feedback, and this continues to be the case. So now people always come and ask me, okay, you did a full lockdown when, uh, you know, we had tiny number of cases and you are opening it up when there is um, a lot more cases. Why are you doing that? Well, because we now had through the food feedback loop process, we now have a much better idea of what we are dealing with. We have better facilities put in place for testing. We have some quarantining ability. And we most importantly have some sense of the nature of the beast. It clearly is very, very infectious. But on the other hand, it perhaps does not have the same kind of um, uh, death rates that may have been feared when we originally saw the Italian numbers, for example. But it clearly is very, very dangerous for certain uh, demographics, I mean, older people with comorbidities, etc. So it's not like uh, uh, it is not still not, it's not like it's less dangerous, but we have a sense of what this beast is that we are dealing and we consequently can make certain educated trade-offs at this point in time. Uh, especially given the economic costs and other things that we have to also deal with. I mean, by the way, even the health costs, after all, it's not the case that other diseases have stopped happening as a result of COVID. So making the various trade-offs, but we can now make some trade-offs and continue to make those trade-offs going forward. Now, let's come to the economic outcome. Here again, other countries have taken a view that upfront they had a model that they have op opted for what is likely to happen. And consequently, based on that, they are reinflating their economies with very large, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, trillions of dollars, etc. Now, first of all, uh, adjusted for um, the same things that are done for us, which is that, you know, should we or shouldn't we include guarantees, etc. The gap is not as large as many people make it out to be. But nevertheless, some guys have done more maybe than we have, say Japan, 20% of GDP and so on. But remember, in every one of those cases, they are making a judgment about where we are going to uh, reinflate into. We, on the other hand, have taken a different view. One, that we do not know how long this will last. So it's sort of like we have taken the call that this is not a T20 match, but we don't really know whether it's a test match or if it's a one-day match, or maybe it's not even cricket. So this is the thinking that we have to take. Secondly, a very important thing, if you listen to the Prime Minister carefully, you will see, we have taken the view that we are not, we shouldn't think of this as a, the post-COVID world being a reinflation of the pre-COVID world. We look at this as a structural change, not dissimilar to what happened after the Great Depression in the Second World War. We should think of it as being back in the 1940s. So if we are back in the 1940s, then we have to, re ha we have to think about this in terms of 
uh, how we adjust the indian economy and take opportunities uh, of this new world it's very clear that the the supply chains the uh, geopolitics the uh, technologies perhaps the the social behaviors of this new world will be very different if that is the case what is the point of using up all our ammunition to reinflate a world that is anyway dying so these are the constraints of our thinking now now that you know this so it's obviously we are emerging into a highly uh, so how do we take uh, you know we uh, how do we take decisions in this highly uncertain environment again we have taken the call the only sensible thing you can do is the barbell strategy so what do you do well you use up some part of the ammunition to essentially cushion the system so and we have done that throughout right up front what was the thing we had to cushion first well there are large numbers of people may not have food they may not have any cash with them so very up front we use the jandhan system to pump through some cash this is not solving poverty but provide some cash provide some physically provide food because we don't know how, what supplies systems have been broken down when we do a lockdown provide them ability to cook so gas um we knew that the financial system would have stresses the business sector would have stresses because of year end issues related to uh, the um, you know closing of books etc so push that uh, down by some months isn't solving the problem but it is uh, and it is indeed kicking the can down the uh, down the road but that's precisely what we are trying to do we are trying to cushion the system then as time passed we began to understand more nuances of this in terms of okay there are serious issues related to the likelihood of cascades of defaults that could begin happening in nbfcs in uh, msmes and so on so what can we do here okay one thing we can do is give them liquidity and lending now why aren't they getting money well because the banks are not willing to lend to them okay let's give them 3 lakh crores um fully 100% guaranteed by government uh loans so that is the context in which we put that in similarly we know that nbfcs which are very important part of the financial ecosystem aren't able to raise money so what do we do we create an spv put some money in that and say that look this is now a buyer of last resort of of these nbfc hfc paper again it's not solving uh, every problem that has happened because of covid what we are doing is clearly a cushioning process at the same time we are not using up all our ammunition because as i said we do not think of this as a sprint we think of this as a marathon uh, at least it's something more than a sprint uh, so consequently we have been quite restrained in using up fiscal space now obviously there are limits to fiscal space in india but even there we have done it step by step feedback loop based this does not mean that we will not use it in the future that we do you know but also remember it's very easy to use up um you know spend tax payers money especially since nobody is really going to blame you right now for doing it uh, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that our children will have to repay all of this back so uh, you know one of the things you consequently have to do it is to do it step by step make sure it reaches where it's necessary Uh, and while you, at the same time recognizing that we have actually more space on the monetary side than on the fiscal side unlike many countries where interest rates were already at zero where already you know no, there was a you know they, there was no credit demand at all this is not the case in india our interest rate structure can be lowered there is a case for pumping out um, uh, credit there is demand for credit there are actually positive things to be done with capital in india which isn't the case in many other countries with, uh, as may be the case so creating the ability to deploy the credit and monetary impulse is an important part of this and here also reserve bank step by step as you can see is continuously lowering interest rates the transmission of that takes time because obviously you have to have a rollover of deposits etc and debt in order for it to transmit but it will transmit slowly and steadily it is beginning to transmit Uh, and more needs to be done on the transmission i'll admit to that so this is the context in which we are now working now here again we do another bunch of things which is very different from what other countries have done other countries have essentially focused on demand side management as i said because their view is essentially of reflating the pre covid world we have taken the opposite view 
but how do you adjust to a post covid world which we don't know what it be like so the most important ingredient of an environment where we do not know what will happen is flexibility and adaptation so what do you do then you essentially invest into flexibility in product and factor markets so that is the context in which you have to understand why we are investing time and energy into labor reforms opening up the agricultural sector and removing all this essential commodities act and other other things that have held it back uh, being absolutely clear and unapologetic about privatization now we know that privatization is difficult to do under these circumstances but we want to be absolutely clear and unapologetic about what we want to do all non non um, uh what's your strategic psus will ultimately be sold when we can do it there is not lack of intent that will hold us back uh, and we are absolutely unapologetic about this um so this is the general model now comes the issue of what does this mean in the context of atmanirbhar bharat which is translated as self reliant india now immediately when this was announced many people jumped in oh my god this is a return to nehruvian import substitution and to inspector raj and so on actually no entirely different idea and in order to understand this you have to understand self reliance in not the use of this term in the period from the 1950s to 1991 it has to instead you have to go back to a deeper roots of this word to a much older tradition going back to tagore and vivekananda and if you go back there the idea of self reliance is really of course using the 19th century term which vivekananda used to use of man making what does that term mean the term means about resilience the term means leveraging local strengths it means essentially uh, personal responsibility it means a sense of national mission and so on and so forth uh, it is a very much a well established literature on this um, oddly enough pre independence because we then abandoned it after independence but if you go back to that literature it's a very well articulated set of ideas um and it is very much about taking on the world and if you listen to the prime minister the moment he said atmanirbhar bharat recognizing where it will, this debate will go he both in his original speech and in the cii speech he then immediately went and talked about going and capturing global supply chains because he knew exactly what was the the argument will go he then talked about actually making fdi simpler to come into india now so this is about standing on then also very fundamentally different from the idea of self reliance in the nehruvian era there the idea was about a commanding heights telling everybody what to do it's a highly centralized top down world view this is an exact opposite and that's why the work localism is very it's a decentralized model we want every layer of the system to have personal responsibility and work harder this is not about the center telling everybody what to do this is about states doing their own thing this is about uh, districts doing their own thing companies doing their own thing individuals doing their own thing and getting the this patron this patronage based top down paternalistic world view and how does this all come together let me explain it with one reform that we have just done and you will see our world view totally coming through in that which is the removal of the essential commodities act and the linked apmc acts at the state level why is this one reform that we were very keen on doing and 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 you know i have been arguing this for years it was a very important part of the latest economic survey just published in um if you read the, the latest economic survey published in uh, february you'll see we talked extensively about it why is this why does this particular thing irritate us so much because because here is a great example of um you know atmanirbharta sort of being violated you are forcing farmers to essentially sell into a 
a certain canalized system of mandis. Why? Because you have the paternalistic view that the farmers do not know how to sell their products or negotiate for themselves. Then you sell it to this, into the mandis. There they are traders. There the traders are also cannot be trusted to uh, do storage. So there you have an inspector who will go and choose how much they can store at which point in time. Now, net result of this is what? You have essentially perpetuated the East India Company. You know, where the East India Company's agents used to tell the farmers to grow opium and meat and uh, indigo. And then they had to sell it at uh, set prices to the East India Company agents. And uh, this whole chain. And if you go back and look at the origins of the APMC Act, you will see all those APMC Acts are based on 19th century East India Company Acts, like the Berar, uh, Cotton and Indigo Act and so on, which were basically meant to buy raw cotton and indigo at cheap prices for Manchester. Why is it that after independence, we have perpetuated this whole system? Basically for doing nothing else other than rent seeking, nothing else. In 2019, 76,000 raids were done against traders, 76,000 of which only 3% stood up in court. So 97% of them were essentially acts of rent seeking. Even the other 3% perhaps were, for all we know. And yet, all this weeping about Indian farmers, when they were not allowed to sell their products and all done in the name of price stability. When every year onion prices went up and down, now, is this anything to do with production? No. Singapore, every year, uh, you go and see onion prices in Singapore, do they go up and down? No. Does it happen in Dubai? Do these countries even grow onions? No. Why is Dubai prices of onions stable without growing onions and not stable in India with growing onions? Because the whole thing has got to do with storage. And why couldn't you have storage? Because anybody who stored was likely to be called a hoarder and essentially raided. So consequently, you never had storage systems, never had pipelines, you never had coal chains. So just this one reform tells you the kind of thinking process we are bringing in. This is about removing this paternalistic top-down thinking and bringing Atman Nirbhata down to the bottom. The farmer is now Atman Nirbhar. It's his business to negotiate. It's his business to decide who he has a contract with, his business to grow it, and so on. So this is the sense in which Atman Nirbharta is there. Now, we recognize that this, and this is, by the way, the same logic why we want to sell off private sector. Uh, sorry, we want to sell off PSUs and privatize them. Because Air India is not Atman Nirbhar. That is, that's, that is the sense you have to understand this. Now, does this mean a step into complete laissez faire? No, because Atman Nirbharta simultaneously is also about resilience. So in this context, it's a very special way in which we will provide protection. It's through safety nets. So when we talk about resilience in terms of our industry, we will provide protection in terms of making sure, for example, the pharmaceutical sector's APIs are to a large extent done domestically where we can, because that is a resilience issue. We can't have, be the world's generics producer and be reliant on, the, on China for APIs. The same logic is true for why we are, on one hand, opening it uh, up FDI to foreigners into de defense, but at the same time, insisting that they do that production in India. The same logic is true why we have removed global tender for 200 crores up to 200 crores because we want the stuff to be produced in India. This is not isolationism because we are okay with foreigners coming and taking part in our domestic production, but they have to do it in India because we want to, again, Atmanirvarta, we want to create domestic capacity. We want to indigenize that technology. Now you can see this is very, very consistent thinking but it is not isolationism. Same thing again about the poor. We, it is this government that invested in safety nets, but it's investing in safety nets, but not investing in dependence. 
because that would violate atmanirbharta so therefore what does this government invest into health insurance it invests into dbt which we have used the janthan yojana aadhar mobile we will consequently you can see the very big difference between dbt using janthan and ayushman bharat on one hand which are all safety net world view and universal basic income which is a dependence world view the same thing is true by the way of our labor reforms we want flexibility for the reasons we discussed earlier an adaptation but at the same labor law reforms by the way are also strengthening safety norms working condition norms and so on we are keen on modernizing safety and work, working norms but at the same time we want labor relations to be flexible it is entirely consistent with our atmanirbharta world view so the point i'm making to you is this is the context in which atmanirbharta has to be understood it is not to sort of disengage with the rest of the world and it is certainly not a case of trying to introduce a inspector raj now with that let me hand it back thank you uh, thank you very much sanjeev because you know uh, we, you are there you have a hard stop at uh, 130 and we have over close to 300 uh, people on uh, this call as well as on facebook twitter youtube your live so there are plenty of questions but i'm very happy that you actually explain what self reliance means because there were a lot of uh, you know meanings given to that word atmanirbharta and uh, i am very happy because i see that it will lead to skill upgradation of our people and uh, what the only uh, caveat that i would like to put on that is we see as as a manufacturer uh, and then as an exporter i see that in many countries uh, they have said that do come do invest in our country but we will let you participate in government tenders only if there is low high value added so go beyond screw driver technology and go above so they have uh, well, local value adds of 75% or so that i see but this is just a suggestion uh, there are plenty of questions with so many people on the call and i will first call uh, our uh, past president mr sudhir jalan uh, to ask a question hi sanjeev nice listening to you again with your clear thoughts we appreciate the wonderful proactive measures government has taken on many fronts and particularly on the supply side what we are concerned about is on the demand side hardly any action has been taken on the demand side even the funds which were supposed to be released from the government departments have not yet been released it has been lot has been announced mr gadkari himself accepts that a huge figure is pending that's one secondly you mentioned rightly about the fiscal deficit that you have kept it in control understandably so but are you keeping your gunpowder dry far too long i'm not saying that you need to shot, shoot everything off like in the us but are you keeping it too low and i leave that to you and the last question is there is a lot of fear about covid and is the fear now something which has to be brought down if the economy is to open up the fear has to be brought down thank you so uh, it's a matter of judgment about as i said um, keeping powder dry we are using some of that powder it's not like we are not using any and i can assure you that we are willing to use more uh, as and when necessary uh, we have to be very careful about uh, for example Uh, pushing heavily on demand uh, when you are in lockdown for example is entirely useless i mean um, what would that demand go it just gets saved and you won't get any second order impacts of um, you know uh, of the demand creation so you have to be very careful not to use that up uh, that doesn't mean that we are not cognizant of the demand situation um, but as it comes back and if demand support is needed i can assure you that we watch this very carefully and will be willing to use the uh, use whatever space we have as i said we have some fiscal space and we have quite a lot of monetary space and there are other measures as well that can be thought of we will do it where necessary for example a pipeline of uh, 
investment projects are also being lined up large investment projects this is a good opportunity as we lower the cost of capital uh, and with global capital being as cheap as it is uh, there is a case for uh, putting together larger uh, a pipeline of large investment projects and so on so there are ways of doing this uh, uh, you, demand is not only about reviving consumption the, the investment is an important part of it uh, building the cycle and investment demand through long longer term in uh, investment infrastructure projects is an important part of our uh, toolkit so that is something that is uh, certainly uh, uh, the case uh, what was your second question if you if, can you remind me what it was uh, you're on mute there is, there is too much of fear and about covid no there was another question uh, the other was on creating demand and one was the fiscal deficit and the last one was whether it's time from hyper fear to ah, okay so well, i well, i can't really answer about mass psychology i have no expertise in it but i think um, uh, these things uh, swing around i mean as we come out of this uh, hopefully uh, as you know things get more and more under control and also uh, there a large part of this just fear of the unknown and as we become more conversant with the nature of this disease which we have already become uh, you know we will learn to deal with it um, it is the case that we will have to deal with it in some fashion uh, as we open up it's not the case that the disease is going away anywhere in the world even if we manage to get rid of it internally as and when we open up to the rest of the world the high likelihood of it coming back so in many ways this we are stuck with it um so um it's something which we will have to manage uh, and much of this management will have to be done at the local level it's not something that can be done centrally anymore uh, we are past that national lockdown phase frankly uh, it's no longer useful or sustainable uh, so as you know uh, it's now being done not just at the state level i think a lot of it has to be done literally at the ward level where the lockdowns will have to be done but i think eventually it will this is also an area where in some ways we'll have to be atmanirbhar personal responsibility in terms of wearing masks and and getting ourselves tested etc has to also be a very important long term part of the solution okay uh, we also have uh, mr sanjeev mehta chairman of hindustan unilever on on the call uh, sanjeev can you ask your question yeah Uh, thanks, Sanjay. Good afternoon, Mr. Sanyal. Delighted to hear you, and thank you for articulating the strategy from the bubble lens. Makes immense sense. You know, even before we went in for the COVID crisis, the demand in the country had slowed down. If you look at even the staples, it had come down to a multi-year low, and the growth had virtually disappeared in rural India. So that's one question. second is building on from what mr jalan has said you know there are two important things for demand to go one is more have more money in the hands of more people and the second is consumer confidence i would just pick up what mr jalan has said forget fear there could be a role that the government has to play in boosting the consumer confidence yeah and there are various ways that could be done and the second is just picking up from what you articulated on demand there could be a stage when the cost of not doing or doing less could exceed the cost of doing how do you monitor at what stage you would have to come with demand intervention at the end of the day that gives a massive boost to the economy and uh, whether you look at it from a lens of your tax collection etc everything would depend on that so yes we should not be imprudent from a perspective also we don't have the resources like the us but considering that we don't end up with comorbidity how do you look at it so that we don't let demand even go deeper down into but kind of create a structure where you start seeing the curve moving northward so uh, one important part of it is that this demand has to be pushed at the time when things have significantly been opened up there's no point in pushing demand completely right absolutely that's a waste of time so yeah. we have conserved it there now that doesn't mean we will not push through uh, more resources but the question here is where do we use this demand to push now one idea let me uh, take an idea which may be 
in some ways indirectly what you're alluding to, why don't we take whatever resources we have and simply transfer it to people? One, one corner solution many people will come up to. Now, the problem here will be the following. Supposing we did actually do this, <clears throat> then what would happen is that, yes, there is a segment of the population that is really, really out of money, needs that money desperately. If you give it to them, they will go out there and spend it because really they're at, their, you know, at the edges of, uh, of the system. But, and this is a matter of judgment, it is very likely that this segment is actually a relatively small segment. And why do we know this? Is that we can actually monitor what's happening with the Jandan accounts. So while there is a segment which that needs to you know, provide a direct support, if you then use the ammunition to generally spray, spray it generically, this segment will also give the money and it's true, they'll go and spend it. But most of the money will get used up providing to people who will actually simply save it. Because you are dealing with somebody who is uh, uh, probably anxious about his or her job. You have given a, extra money to that person and that person will probably just save it. And consequently, you will not get the second and third order impact on demand that you are asking for. So you will have used up your ammunition your clock will be ticking as far as paying back those debts because they, these are on positive interest rates. And you will have got very little bang for your buck. Okay. So let me give you the alternative. The alternative is to focus on those guys who are really at the bottom and use that much money or ammunition to directly target. Them. That is the concept of DBT as opposed to universal basic income. We are not spraying generically money in the hope that some of it will connect and get spent. We are trying to target the guys where possible. So how do we do it? Well, you, um, you uh, provide food directly, physical provide food, both through the usual ration shops or through uh, now for migrants, we have made it much easier for them to pick up food wherever they can. And then move towards, hopefully by March, we will have got a one nation, one ration card out there. So basically, direct, then you get directly get to the Jhangan accounts cash in there. It's again, some amount of spraying happens because not every Jhangan account is going to the bottom. There are people who are relatively well off and are still getting, but it doesn't matter. It's relatively speaking, it's targeted. You also provide, for example, extra money for Menrega because many of these workers are going back Again, remember, it's a demand-driven thing. Somebody who doesn't need Manrega is not at its wit's end. He's not turning up there to dig a pond or whatever. So it, is, it has a self-selecting characteristic. So you do that. Then you provide further support for the health uh, insurance front. So these are the ways in which you do it. Some of these will have to be done at the state level as well because there are other natural disasters also happening, for example, in Bengal. So this is the way you target the bottom to keep this going. This is a cushioning operation, but basically you are not relying on this to revive demand because as I said, a person who is very, very anxious about his job is not rushing out there to use the extra money you gave him to, to go out there and um, begin to spend. What you need, instead need to do is to protect jobs and create real jobs, okay? So this is the context in which we are trying to cushion this as far as possible for the SME sector. What are we trying to do? We're trying to cushion jobs. We are similarly for the formal sector, what are we doing? We are taking on the EPF and directly paying it ourselves. What are we doing? Protecting jobs. Then we are going out there and saying, we will use the whatever space we have to try and create a pipeline of infrastructure projects of real jobs. Because a guy who has got a real job is more likely to go out there and leverage with the low interest rates, hopefully, and buy a car, buy a new apartment, take advantage of the fact that real estate prices have gone down. All of this will be done not by a guy to whom I've given a one, one time transfer, but by a guy who actually has a job, right? 
So it is better use of my resources to try and get real activity going through real jobs rather than doing these transfers. That's why, as I said, there's a difference between the DBT idea and a universal basic income idea. Fundamentally different ideas. Now what you do is then you say, look, we are emerging into this new environment. Where will these investments go into? Because I have no idea what this new world will require. So again, invest in why we are doing the supply side measures. Because if you don't upfront do the supply side measures in, in anticipation of future demand, we will, not, we will get either demand going into the useless things, i.e. investment in things that won't last. And in any case, we will not be able to do what our main aim is, which is to participate in global supply chains. Even the guys who are coming in for domestic demand purposes, how, why will they hire anyone? So at the state level, you have to begin doing the land reforms. You have to begin doing the privatization. You have to begin doing the labor reforms. All the things, by the way, all of you in our earlier years of AMI have been telling us to do. Similarly, we are freeing up the farmers. There's no point in asking farmers to grow more and more of the same cereals. We have too much of it. We don't have enough space in FCI to fill them. So what do we want them to do? The agriculture is essentially consequently a dead sector. How do we revive it? Well, you do what exactly what you did to them in 1991 to the rest of the sector. Open them up. Let them grow things. Create an internal market. Remove uh, you know, after all, you create a common market, then, you know, I want to have mushrooms from Kerala. So let me have mushrooms from Kerala. What is the problem? Why do I only have to have mushrooms uh, grown in Haryana or whatever? I mean, similarly, why can't they be, why can't we be exporting all of this stuff? Because everything, when you create, if you want to export and compete, you need cold, uh, cold storage chains. Why doesn't anyone invest in cold storage chains? Well, if anybody does invest in any of this, he will be called a hoarder just when he's making money. The day he makes making money, he'll be called a hoarder. So you remove all of these fellows out of the system and throw them out into the dustbin of history. So that is the context in which, so then you will begin to get real jobs being created, real uh, activity begin to come back. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Mr. Sunil Munjal. Thank you. Uh, Sanjeev has expected a wonderful, holistic commentary on where we are and where we would like to go. Uh, I'd just point a couple of things which may be helpful for us to understand our path going forward. Uh, in recent times, we have seen Vietnam, Indonesia, even Thailand, Malaysia, Brazil take away more of the opportunities which were coming out of the US-China trade war and more recently, this anger against China of both industrial opportunities to be set up inside India, as also Indian companies to become uh, uh, supply chain partners to global companies who have this one plus one strategy, where they're looking for an alternate in addition to China, not to replace China, but in addition to China. All these countries seem to have done better than us. Is there a learning there for us? Or could we go back even to the 70s if you remember the Samuel Undong program that Korea ran to, to build capabilities in the rural areas. I'm not talking of the, the program which they did to the tribals, but the one we did to the rural areas to build industrial and economic activity in there. Could we use our panchayats? We have a wonderful Panchayati Raj institution that was set, set up many decades ago, but is hardly functioning in this manner. It, it otherwise functions well. Is there, is there a unique opportunity out there? And of course, concomitant to that is our need to realign our education and vocational skills program to meet the needs of the country and the economy and the jobs going forward, where they will come from. Uh, it's clear technology will be a big driver. Uh, labor, to some extent, will not come back to the urban areas while it is expected. Uh, what I'm hearing is that 30% will never come back 30% will come back, but after Diwali or next year, and it's only 30% that will come back right now. So actually it's offer, offering us two interesting opportunities to the point you're making to in the rural areas to do massive new industrialization, especially post harvest, dairy, et cetera, and including by the way, warehousing and, and, and uh, cold storage, et cetera. And in the urban areas to look at massive technology infusion, automation, 
higher order of, of uh, both manufacturing and services. Are we equipped, do you think, to take advantage of that? And could we put in all the, you've, you've started down that road. Atman Nirbhar is a wonderful, wonderful initiative, by the way. Could we ensure that we're embellishing it with all of the needs that are there to make this work at the center as also the states? So you've raised a very important issue. And all I will say is this is a huge, huge, huge opportunity for India. Not yep. just for the government, for you, yep. the industry, uh, and for a country as a whole. I mean, every citizen. This has got to be taken up as a national mission. Not just in terms of thinking in a small way. I would even say that what happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s was a small thing. In the sense that you have to understand that all of the industrialization after the Second World War, uh, whether it's the revival of China, uh, Japan and uh, Germany, or it was then the mix and then of China. All of these were geopolitical events as much as they were economic events. And the geopolitics of the world just finally completely changed. And it happens to some extent later on. Now, that doesn't mean that we'll be able to necessarily make it happen. But this it has to be thought of as a national mission. Uh, let me assure you at the central government level, uh, people like me are totally open. Our doors are always open, or rather our Zoom is always open nowadays to listen to, give us feedback. We will make those changes and we are open to doing it. We, in fact, even before this, you will remember, we put feedback and lowered the uh, corporate tax rates as have been uh, in demand. There are other changes too, but there are, please make similar demands from the states. Please be demanding of the states. Go out there and yeah. ask them to do things I can assure you, I've talked to several state-level officials over the last few weeks. Some of the states are really rearing to go. So, uh, I think this everybody is beginning to appreciate this is an opportunity. And it's not something where this is, a, you know, the government and the, the, the private sector are at loggerheads in any way. This is a national mission. So, you tell us what you need. If it's a reasonable ask, we will do it. No, we, we will come back to you. One of the areas, uh, Sanjeev, this has been discussed for the last 30 years in India, is the largest manufacturing industry in the world is the electronic hardware uh, industry. And we are massive importers of that. After the oil bill, in fact, now it might become bigger than the oil bill, actually. And, and that cannot function unless you put up fab facilities or even at least a fabless facility. I, 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 I am not going to argue with that. Tell us how to do this. Ha hammer away at whoever the relevant department is and use, uh, you know, whatever is needed. Um, yep. You know, don't have to be polite. Please do not be polite. Yeah, I can <laughs> okay. tell you, you can walk into my office and use all the four letter words you want and say, get this done. I will take it entirely in the right spirit. So, so the point is, this is a national mission. If we are, if we are failing in it, this you know, uh, this is a failure, your failure and my failure. We are in, in this boat together. We have got to make this work. This is a reorganization of the world, of the largest reorganization of the world since the Great Depression and the Second World War. And this, many, many things will happen out of it. The way we think of our cities, the way our, you know, our transport systems are set up, everything is going to go into a different logic. And we have to be willing, and it's a huge, huge opportunity, by the way. So we have to think, we have to be willing to relocate even our holy, holiest of holy laws that we have in our book. We should be willing to look at. Nothing, then we have a definite set of set of recommendations for you in that case. Please come and tell us. Yep. Look, essential commodities actors are very holy, uh, holiest of holy uh, laws. Yep. You know, it was one of the ten commandments. We have changed it. Mm -hmm. Everybody was mealy mouthed about privatization. We are telling you totally unapologetically about the whole thing. So you tell Good. us what you tell us. Thank you. Labor law is another of the Ten Commandments. We are telling you we are going to change it. And by the way, we are changing it in a very peculiar way. Hmm. I, I told you, we are actually going to tighten up safety and and uh, yeah. working condition laws. We are actually introducing yeah. nationwide uh, minimum wages. So. It's not entirely, as some people may claim, against uh, labor. 
No, no, I don't think industries, by the way, ever asked for flexibility. I don't think uh, industries ever asked for what has popularly come to be known as hire and fire. Industry does want a balanced regulation. Yeah, so you, we are giving it to you. Yeah. You tell yeah. us. And by the way, we are yeah. doors are also open to the unions. If you think yep. there is something good to be done, we will do it. By the way, if you read about the rebuilding of Japan and 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 Germany after the Second World War, it it was very much a partnership between industry and and labor. And the relationship, it's a, it's a, you know, the antagonistic relationships that are embedded into our statute books are a result of the 1960s and 70s uh, communist labor movement, uh, which should be changed. So there is that is not the necessarily the only way labor uh, relations have been globally managed, and we should re, we should be open to rethinking it, and not just from the perspective of industry. It should. It is from the perspective of labor as well. As I said, there are some some areas where we have no sense of humor, um, like, uh, for example, health insurance and things like that. Uh, in fact, uh, formalization. You know, it would have been so much easier for us to deal with the current crisis if the bulk of our workers were formalized. We would have known exactly where to provide uh, help to them, but we can't because they're not formalized. So one of the things which we are insisting on is uh, proper formal appointment letters, because that will allow us. If we have such a situation in the future, to directly help workers. Right now, we are having to do it for fun, formal workers through EPF, but for unorganized worker, we have to do so through jandan, etc., which is sort of works, but it is an indirect way of helping informal workers. So you know, so we are very keen on direct, targeted help, and consequently, all of this would have been so much easier with with um, a, a formalized workforce, and we are very keen on that as well. So wherever possible, we need we are willing to to step in there and help. So so totally with you. You give us whatever whatever are the measures you want done. We will look at it. If it's a reasonable thing, which takes into account the you know environmental labor and the usual kinds of things, um, we will uh, you know uh, we try and do it. And by the way, since you had earlier mentioned education. The largest import into India after uh, oil is incidentally not electronics but education. We are sending all our kids abroad to study at universities that are clearly overpriced. To listen to lectures, they can all listen to on YouTube. <laughs> True. <laughs> now, Sanjay, while, while we are talking about uh, agriculture and. Uh, you know the rural economy let's also not forget about our age old handicrafts how do we modernize them how do we upgrade the skills as far as i know uh, you know indian silks go to finishing houses in italy why can't they be finished here for global market so, so you are the you are the industrialist you tell me why yeah. the government should not get other than you know from providing some some support through khadi and other things uh, uh, you know I'm talking about skill upgrade for me to, for me to be telling you it would be a paternalistic activity which i which i have ideological problems with okay uh, our last uh, question looking at the time is from our uh, senior vice president mr harshpati singhani uh, hello sanjeev uh, thank you very much for that uh, a very um, um, clear presentation about actually speaking joining the dots and uh, telling us how uh, the thinking has been um, in government uh i i would uh, I mean, we would all be very appreciative of the long term reforms that you uh you know you talked about many of them the apmc dismantling and the and bringing in competitiveness through factor market and product market inputs uh but if we were not in a covid world uh these would have but these are long term and therefore these would have been most welcome and we would see the effects even today i, I would submit that and a lot of that we are not able to appreciate right now but our biggest problem and i hate to go back to the is we to talk sorry you're breaking up we are not being able to... you're completely breaking up i can't hear you is not i can't hear you harsh can you hear me better can you hear us now yeah sort of uh, hello can you hear better mr singhania put off your video it might be better 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Okay. Is that better? No? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I was saying that you know the the absolutely correct, but we are still struggling with the issue of the short term. And I had to go back to the issue of demand, but we are opening up factories and workshops. And you rightly talked about job preservation, but till a front end can be, you know, can be stronger, this is going to, is a factor, particularly for MSMEs. So may I submit that maybe as you, some of the ammunition that you're saving, can we focus on some large sectors, for example, whether it be the auto industry or the construction industry, because they impact many, many uh, supply chains and businesses. So, for example, oh, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. I, I think we, we do need to begin to uh, put effort in. I mean, we, and we will use whatever space we have to uh, help demand. Um, and as I said, uh, one of the sectors which are obvious is to speed up uh, large, large infrastructure projects. And uh, I think you've already heard that. Um, uh, from others, I'm not the first to mention this, uh, senior ministers have also mentioned this, uh, that bringing uh, a pipeline of large projects and getting going with it as we open up the lockdown is an important project. By the way, there are several projects that are simply stuck as a result of this lockdown. Just getting those going going uh, would not be a trivial thing. There is, of course, an issue, of course, of course, or, or also of uh, speeding up payments and so on, which in many cases have been stuck. And I fully sympathize with that. And I think finance minister and I think the MSME ministers yeah. also made, made the point that this has to be, this, there are no excuse for non-payments and delays in payments. So uh, that is certainly, I fully, fully agree with that. One small other comment, if I may submit, this for execution of your, of this whole Atmanirbhar Bharat and this whole game plan, very close cooperation between the center and the states is going to be essential. So that is another thing which will require constant working. There is no easy answer. But if we can achieve that, then we will be able to get the true benefits it's, of it's what a, is it's a, it's a national mission in which every element will have to play a role. The local government will also have to play a role. And do not only think of this as a government thing. You will have to play a role as industry. Labor will have to play a role. Civil society will have to play a role. All kinds of elements will have to come together as a national mission. So I think Atmanirbhar Bharat is not about the, this is not about the planning commission from the commanding heights telling everybody what to do. This is the partnership and we, and it's a decentralized partnership because you will have to be, you know, at various layers, you will have to partner with different people. We are open here and I can assure you at different layers in the state government, some of the state governments are already rearing to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal, for a wonderful session. You were very frank. I think the discussion was very frank. Uh, your explanation about what Atmanirbharta means, I think, has struck a chord. And a large number of us really now understand what government in intends to do. So since it's uh, 1.30, I will close the session. Thank you very much. Rekha, uh, would you like to say something? I'd just like, I'd just like to add my thanks to Mr. Kirloskas. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Sanyal. We invited you to address the council, but having you was so great with us that we decided to open up the session to other members also. So we've had a great response on Zoom, on YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. And I think everybody, the comments that are seen, I see on the chat are wonderful. I think every member has appreciated the frank way that you've spoken to everybody. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your participation in more IMA events going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.